going on guys welcome back to the mike force podcast it's your host mike g hey guys we're doing a special episode that's not very special it's tragic we're talking about active shooters active shooting because of what took place yesterday in uvalde texas in a remote rural town 15,000 people 80 percent hispanic 20 percent white filling the gap with the rest um when an 18 year old shooter goes in to a school and kills 21 people, including 19 children and two adults. I'm going to read you right now some of the headlines just so we could have an accurate depiction of what took place as it's been updated. Um, and this is news reports as of a couple minutes ago. Um, grief counselors, ministers, and therapy dogs provide counsel and solace Wednesday to community members. The elementary school where a gunman's rampage killed 19 children and two teachers in one fourth grade classroom. It was the state's deadliest shooting in modern history, the nation's third mass shooting within weeks. An 18 year old male, armed with a rifle, shot his grandmother before driving to rob elementary school and overpowering a school officer. Authorities said Lieutenant Christopher Alvarez of the Texas Department of Public Safety told the CNN the children and teachers who died were inside a single classroom where the shooter barricaded himself before he was fatally shot. Authorities identified the gunman as Salvador Ramos, 18, but revealed no motive. Ramos had hinted on social media that an attack would be coming. According to State Senator Roland Gutierrez, who said he was briefed by the state police, he said the gunman suggested the kids should watch out, and they had bought two assault weapons after turning 18. It's a terrible morning, a terrible morning. Uvalde resident Juan Torres, 31, said Wednesday as he sat on the front porch a few blocks from the school. We are shocked, stressed out, and traumatized. The killer entered the classroom, locked the door, and started shooting. Alvarez told CNN. Officers arriving on the scene began breaking windows around the school, trying to evacuate children and teachers. Alvarez said a tactical team forced its way into the classroom and faced gunfire, but was able to shoot and kill the suspect. Multiple students in classroom were wounded, and officials have said that death toll could rise. Alvarez did not know how many students were in the room when the shooting started, but it normally holds 25 to 30 kids. A typical classroom setting where you have mass groups of children inside that classroom all together with nowhere to go. It just shows you the complete evil of the shooter. Uvalde does not have its own medical examiner, so Justice of Peace uh, Diaz was called upon to identify the victims. Families waiting at the Civic Center for the news of the children provided DNA swabs to authorities to aid in the identification process. We know everybody said reflect on how children and um, his children in 8th and 12th grades will be marked to the tragedy. We know children who were there. We've talked for years about mental health facilities nearby. We don't have anything. The child was probably suffering for something that was never diagnosed. The way you get diagnosed here is you end up in jail. This kid never made it to jail. Uh, a neighbor dies in the carnage. Looking across the street at Brown House, Javier Rangel, 57, remember the young girl who used to play out front. Rangel lives a few blocks from Rob where the girl was a student. He said her father posted a Facebook last night that she was among the dead. This has hit us bad knowing there were young kids just starting their lives, said Rangel, a truck driver, we never thought it would happen in this little town. I was used to seeing her riding her bike, playing with her sisters, that poor little girl. Sandy Hook parents urge bold action. Nicole Hockley and Mark Barden, co-founders and CEOs of Sandy Hook Promise, each, son had a, uh, each had a son killed in the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting spree that killed 26 a decade ago. They issued a statement saying they are sickened under the weight of our sadness as we watch another community of families suffering their worst nightmare. And they called on everyone to urge elected officials to pass legislation that protects children. This could be done while upholding the Second Amendment rights, the statement said. Now is the time to, to take bold action. As a country, how much longer can we stand while innocent children continue to be killed? Uh, other news reports um, speak about the current policies that are being pushed right now for legislation against guns. So let me go ahead and Google search this. This is in real time. This is happening right now. You'll probably listen to this only a couple hours before I recorded this podcast. So gun policy. I'm going to read you the latest headlines on post shooting of what's going on in the news. Biden calls for action on gun laws after 21 killed in Texas shooting. This is reported by The Guardian. 
The president has delivered remarks at the White House on today's mass shooting. I had hoped when I became president I would not have to do this again, another massacre. He began an emotional speech. Uh, let me get another news story. Biden blames Texas school shooting on gun lobby demands new gun laws from the New York Post. President Biden on Tuesday said the gun lobby is responsible for U.S. mass shootings and called for the new gun controls after a gunman murdered 18 children and two adults at an elementary school. As a nation, we have to ask when in God's name are we able, are we going to stand up to the gun lobby? When in God's name will we do what all we know and our gut needs to be done? Biden's remarks were in the White House just before 9 p.m. It's been 3,448 days, 10 years since I stood up at a grade school in Connecticut where another gunman massacred 26 people, including 20 first graders at Sandy Hook Elementary. Since then, there have been over 900 incidents of gunfire reported on school grounds. The list grows when you include mass shootings at places like movie theaters, houses of worship, as we saw in just 10 days at a grocery store in Buffalo, New York. I'm sick and tired of it. We have to act and don't tell me we can't have an impact on this carnage. Salvador Ramos, 18, allegedly shot his grandmother before arriving around noon local time at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, about 80 miles west of San Antonio. Uh, we can't prevent and won't prevent every tragedy, but we know gun laws work and have a positive impact. When we passed the assault weapons ban, mass shootings went down. When the law expired in 2004, mass shootings tripled. Um, I don't think that's true. Uh, we, we could fact check that. The idea that an 18-year-old kid could walk into a gun store and buy two assault weapons is just wrong. What in God's name do we need an assault weapon for except to kill someone? Deer aren't running through the forest with Kevlar vest on, for God's sake. It's just sick, and the gun manufacturers have spent two decades aggressively marketing assault weapons, which make them most and largest profit. For God's sake, we have the courage, have the courage to stand up and uh, to the industry. But included by nothing... By noting the U.S. has more mass shootings than any other country and calling for new gun control. And they show a picture of the suspect. Um, let's go ahead and talk about this, guys. So, a whole bunch of things that we know that we didn't know yesterday. There's more kids as of this morning that have been killed. We also know that there was a school officer that was overpowered by the shooter. I don't know what that means. I, I want to get more information. If you're a, a DPS officer, if you're somebody intimately involved with this, you could email me at mike.fieldcraft at gmail.com. I'm looking for as many facts as possible to articulate to you the proper education and the way forward. One of uh, the things that we also know is that a Border Patrol agent who was off duty ran to the sound of gunfire, assisted in the uh, taking down of the suspect and ending the massacre. I imagine if 25 to 30 students were in that classroom, that fourth grade classroom that he barricaded himself in uh, with two teachers, I'm assuming, that were in that classroom with their children, um, they, they went into a hail of gunfire. If it wasn't for the actions of those brave officers, who, who knows how many children would have potentially been killed. Now, the first thing I knew was going to happen is to talk about gun laws. You know, it's not hard for us to distinguish the how. The how is easy. He used an AR-15. He used a pistol. The reports were yesterday that he used a pistol. There was a rifle there, but it doesn't matter. He used a gun. The how is easy. Every mass shooting that involves guns, the how is very easy to define. The why is the most important. Because as we sit here and address symptoms, we're not addressing the problem. One of the major problems here is obviously mental health. Mental health. I mean, a rational and healthy human being doesn't pick up a rifle, a pistol, and go into an elementary school and kill kids. We understand that. So we also understand that we are a nation of gun owners. The same weapons that are protecting the president, state officials, local and government officials, institutions, are the same weapons that we as American citizens should have the right to own 
in bearing arms to protect ourselves. What we don't understand, because it's not been talked about, is how mental health is being grossly affected by all the things that are happening in this country. Poverty. COVID. Social media. I mean, the list goes on. What I've not seen a headline on, which has been very apparent from the reading that I've done, is the shooter was transgender, apparently. Now, I don't know if that's true, but I saw a report on him being transgender, and it showed pictures of him cross-dressing. I don't know if that, that doesn't make him transgender, but there are certainly a lot of uh, photographic evidence of that. Well, why, sh- why would that matter? Because it doesn't define the how, because the how we understand, but it might define the why. All the statistics and mental health um, issues related to uh, transgender being at an elevated risk of suicide and mental health issues are studies that have been done by people smarter than me. And we know that to be the fact. We know that to be the case. Immediately, politicians are knee-jerk reacting to gun control because they have to control the lobbyists. The reason they have to control the lobbyists is because the lobbyists determine outcomes of elections. And when you look at gun lobby organizations, which have a lot of power through wealth, through influence, they want to stop them because if they stop them, then they stop the, the rights and the votes of the people. Listen, I said this on my live last night, and I'll say it again very clear. What makes us free, independent people of this great nation is the fact that we are an armed, we are an armed society. Because in an armed society, you have tyrannical governments, tyrannical, oppressive institutions, and people that want to take advantage of weak It's one reason why the political strategy on the far left is to make you more dependent on the system because the government is the answer. And if you're more dependent, then the government has more control. So if you're taking the handouts, if you're taking the welfare check, if you're taking the food stamps, if you're taking the subsidies, they have you. If they take your guns, they have utilitarian control. And so when we look at what's going on in our nation right now today with them proposing gun laws that are literally going to change the course of our history, we have to ask ourselves, is that the solution? Is that the, is that the answer here? We talked about the assault weapons ban. I'm going to do a simple Google research that you could do live right now did the assault weapons ban stop shootings or let's do reduce shootings there's a fact check um biden's claim that the 1994 assault weapons ban this is done by the washington post brought down mass shootings. Okay, his president, president's remarks, we can ban assault weapons and high capacity magazines in this country once again. I got that done when I was a senator. It passed. It was the law for the longest time and it brought down these mass shootings. We should do it again. Whether the Clinton era ban on assault weapons pushed through the Senate by Biden was effective has been a subject of interest for politicians and researchers and the fact checker. Every few years, usually after a mass shooting, we find ourselves digging into the research. So here it is. The facts. In 1994, Clinton signed into law the ban on assault weapons and large capacity magazines, defined as those that could hold more than 10 rounds. The law, which grandfathered in an estimated 1.5 million assault weapons and 25 million um, uh, large capacity magazines already owned by Americans, was in place for 10 years until George W. Bush let it lapse. Even supporters of the law have acknowledged that it was riddled with loopholes, such as allowing copycat weapons to be sold. That limited its effectiveness. A 2004 study for the Justice Department 
found that the ban's impact on gun violence was mixed at best. Because of exemptions written into the law, if the ban were renewed, the effects on gun violence are likely to be small at best and perhaps too small for liable measurement. This is done by the Justice Department and reported by the Washington Post. The report said that the assault weapons ban were rarely used in gun crimes, but suggested that if the law remained in place, it might have a bigger impact. A Northeastern University professor collected data back to 1982 showing the assault weapons account for 24.6% of public mass shootings. Let me say that again. James Allen Fox, a Northeastern University professor, as reported by the Washington Post, collected data back in 1982 showing shootings that involved an assault weapon accounted for 24.6% of public mass shootings dating back to 1982. Assault weapons are not as commonplace in mass shootings as some gun control advocates believe. Fox wrote in 2013 article in the journal Homicide Studies. Instead, semi-automatic handguns, which account for 47.9%, are far more prevalent in random massacres than firearms that would typically be classified as assault weapons. 47.9%, let's just call it 50%. 50% of weapons used in mass shootings are pistols, semi-automatic pistols. Did the assault weapons ban make a difference in mass shootings? Not significantly, according to Fox's data at the time. From 1976 to 94, about 18 mass shootings occurred each year during the ban From 1995 to 2004, there were about 19 incidents per year. After the ban, through 2011, the average went up to nearly 21. That was the state of play in 2016. When a claim that a rise in mass shootings was related to the expiration of the ban earned three Pinocchios at the time, even when lawmakers making the claim could not point to the data that would support the assertion. But the mass shootings over the years, the possible impact of the 1994 law has has come into greater focus. Christopher Coper, an associate professor of criminology at George Mason University, was the author of 2004 Justice Department study that found the law had minimal effect. Minimal effect. So, is this, is this the answer here? No, it's not. No. Let's, let's use some um, common sense, some logic here. You have a shooter who, transgender, cross-dressing, whatever it was, showed a whole bunch of signs and indications of mental health issues, including saying the children better watch out. I'm paraphrasing. He goes into a school after shooting his grandmother and barricades himself in a classroom and starts killing kids. So let's start off with the schools. Let's do this. How many public schools in the U.S. There are 98,755 public schools, 13,477 middle, 2,500 junior high, and 23,900 secondary schools. Okay. Let's just take it. There's 100,000 public schools in America. How many government buildings are in the U.S.? Oh, staggering. There's 306,000, 306,000 government buildings. According to the U.S. General Services Administration, in addition, the government leases 55,000 buildings. Actually, the total is 361,000. These include offices, hospitals, warehouses, and other sort of facilities. 306,000 plus the 55,000 that are leased by the U.S. government. How many of those buildings do you believe have security? Every government building that I've been inside has some level of security. It has a security officer, has a security protocol, it has a security system, has technology integrated into that security system. It has a protocol with off-duty officers and them moonlighting and protecting it. And it has a protocol to notify them on call if something happens. It has lockdown procedures. It has armed guards within the building and has cameras, CCTV in and out. So when we look at 100,000 public schools, we just sent $40 billion to Ukraine, 40 billion. So we're asking the question, which is 
using rational decision-making common sense, is enacting an assault weapons ban, which Biden wants. The answer here, is it going to fix the problem? The answer based on an assault weapons ban where we have good data on is no, it won't do anything, especially now with the overwhelming amount of weapons that are in circulation. If a bad guy wants to harm innocent people because they are a soft and easy target, they will do that. If they don't use an M16, an AR-15, a semi-automatic pistol, a shotgun, they will use a car, they will use a knife, they will use whatever means possible because that's how evil people are. That's what they do. We don't like to hear that honest evaluation of what evil people are. But here we are, debating it once again. So I just saw on my own social media channel, a lot of people that I love and respect on social media that I'm even friends with talking about we need to do something. And they say more laws is how we do something. A law restricting a law-abiding citizen is not the path to success. Because the problem here in defining the why is we are dealing with a systemic mental health issue of people harming innocent people because they are easy targets. So, the recommendation. One, the recommendation is a universal protocol. I've already put it out and I've already received about 20 messages from different schools, which I'm thankful for. We're getting to those emails today of communicating a standard operating procedure by identifying the school, the district, and the law enforcement officers that are going to respond to that school and making sure that their protocols are wired tight. I am not the end-all be-all solution in active shooting. I have taught it for over a decade. I understand exactly what the problems and deficiencies are, and I have a standard operating procedure in making it better. With that being said, these agencies and these schools need a consultant like me. I'm not asking for money. I'm doing the shit for free. Because I don't want to see your child get killed in a mass shooting because of the lack of security protocol or the lack of somebody not doing their job. Because the policy, the law, if you haven't figured this out, people, criminals don't follow the law. So when you create more laws suppressing law-abiding citizens' rights, the only thing you're doing is creating more criminals of innocent people who are law-abiding. Because the person who owns the AR-15 at home is a responsible citizen to protect and defend their family isn't doing the crime. It's 18-year-old transgender weirdos who are going into schools and after killing their grandmother or shooting their grandmother and going to schools and killing children. It's radically motivated and racially uh, 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 racist uh, white nationalists who decide they want to go and, and kill black people. The common thread here, it's mental health. It's not racism. It's not transgenderism. It's mental health. It's not access to firearms because access to firearms is easy, just like access to a vehicle to run over children is easy. What we need to talk about is the protocols that exist currently in place, and there are none. You need an active consultant to come in to break bread, build rapport, and understand the relationship. <clears throat> Create the protocol. Put in place the SOP. Rehearse. Repeat. Make sure that every single student, every single teacher, and every single school official, every single law enforcement officer knows exactly on the same sheet of music how to accomplish this, how to get it done. One, without understanding the totality of the circumstance, the bad guy should have never had access to the school. I don't know how he got in. But those schools should be closed and locked down when school is in session. Well, yeah, Mike, they can get in before. That's why we have technology integrated into the system. Because not only should our schools be looked at as fortified positions like government institutions are, we should create the protocols to represent that. Meaning the school has school grounds. We should have controlled access to schools. 
Right now, in every school in my neighborhood, I could drive up to the front door of that school right now. Right now. Thank God I live in Wasatch County. I talked to Mike Guyman, one of the local sheriffs yesterday. And in Wasatch County, there is an armed officer in every school. If those officers are trained in physical security and emergency management in crisis response, in active shooter protocols, then they literally will make it their job to always make sure security is checked and done properly at their school. ID cards. When I used to check into USASOC and Special Operations Command, I drove through a gate. That gate allowed me access via a card. That card was scanned. If our schools have gates, which is not that expensive, where you have a controlled access point because our children are our most valuable commodity. They are the world's most valuable asset because they are our future. Then we should protect them. If we're putting control access points at federal government buildings times 300,000 different government institutions throughout the country, then why aren't we doing this for our children? Why aren't we allocating the budget? Instead of spilling Spending $40 billion on Ukraine, let's spend a couple hundred million dollars on getting this right. I don't mind if the federal government gets involved. Because if the federal government gets involved and they're working on protocols and they're funding the fencing, the access points, the control points, getting the teachers on the same sheet of music, training the teachers, then we have a safe institution where kids can thrive because they feel safe. How do you feel now today, allowing your kids to go to school? I guarantee you don't feel safe. I guarantee you feel anxious like me. I said it and I'll say it again. I will never outsource the security of my children to anybody on this planet. I am in a good financial situation. I'm successful as an entrepreneur. So I am not the 25,000 medium income of Uvalde, Texas. But I will not outsource the security of my children to a public institution because they fail every time. For those who believe in the government so much, you don't understand government because government is people. Name one group of people, name a business, name a family, name a, a, a tribe that doesn't have corruption, issues, drama. That's people. So you're entrusting all of your trust in the government when you should be taking back that dependency and being more self-reliant. Are you going to outsource your security? Is 911 going to save you when the bad guy's kicking in your front door? Is the paramedic going to save you when you, la- you know, when you have a laceration on your leg and you're bleeding out of your femoral? No, you are. You are with your legal firearm, with your training, with your mindset, with your self-reliance. You don't have the time. You have to be your own first response. So what happens when you outsource that protection, that security, to your public institution? What happens when you outsource that to a public school who's supposed to protect your children, whose job it is to protect your children? They're protecting that judge. They're protecting that governor and that mayor. Why aren't they protecting your children? One of the things we started looking at, I contacted my lawyer already, is filing litigation in the state of Utah for having a armed officer at every public school in the state of Utah. If you are a school board official, if you are a politician in the state of Utah, and you're not fighting to have an armed officer at your public school, you're wrong. You're setting your children up for failure. Look, I I grew up in the public school system. In good old Fayetteville, North Carolina. The biggest shithole in the country. 
I went to public school at Douglas Bird High School where I was bullied. I got in fights. I saw school shootings, school stabbings, fights every single day. I was jumped by six dudes at the back of my school when I was 13 years old. I understand the public school institution. You know what changed? When we brought in an armed officer. When we brought in metal detectors to to scan students going into the school. I understand public school institutions and violence. You know what our protocol right now is for active shooter in institutions, according to the federal government? It's an acronym called Run, Hide, Fight. An emergency procedure meant to allow you to operate without overthinking because action is faster than reaction. So we tell children to run. We tell them to hide in hidey holes. And as a last ditch effort, we tell them to fight. One of the things that we forget technically in talking about all of the acronyms and emergency procedures is you're going to be faced with a sympathetic nervous response and fighting through cortisol, norepinephrine, which is adrenaline, elevated heart rate, all of these things that change you physiologically, which impact your decision making. We don't talk about that. We don't talk about the decibel range of a firearm enacting this response in children. I could put you in a fight, flight, or freeze response, a sympathetic nervous response, by yelling at you. Because your middle ear has a trigger. And I could trigger that middle ear with my voice. And then once you go into that fight, flight, or freeze mode, everything changes. The way you take in information, the way you process that information, and the decisions you make are all affected. But we don't talk about that. So what happens in your protocol when the gunshots go off and all of your students lay down in the prone and fear for their lives and you're telling them to move and they don't move? What kind of training do you have for that? Because we walk through the training. I've seen it. Hey, guys, we're going to whiteboard active shooting. No, 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 no. You can't whiteboard active shooting training. You have to do it with some munitions. You have to do it with flashbangs. It has to be loud because you need to stress inoculate the kids. You need to stress inoculate the teachers because they need to identify how the children react under stress and how they're going to navigate that for the children under stress. Because teachers, you're basically a squad leader in the infantry where you got a squad or a platoon full of privates that you have to get through the gunfight. We don't want to address that because we don't want to deal with the realities of active shootings. I wonder how, how your life would be changed if you were an officer who walked into that classroom and saw those children laying in piles of blood. How that would affect you and your understanding, your empathy, You're going after gun laws. Hopes and prayers wouldn't have saved those kids. A gun is what ultimately saved the other children. Because a Border Patrol agent decided to go into gunfire, run towards the sound of gunfire. Two officers supposedly were shot. Both of them likely to survive. Because they were willing to go into harm's way to save those children. And how many children did they not save? If we had security protocols in place, we would have been able to save those children. It's not that hard. It's physical security protocols. If I tell your children to run, where are they running to? Do you know? Well, Mike, run away from the gunfire. Okay, then what? There were police officers breaking out the glass, evacuating children out of other classrooms, rescuing them. Why don't we have a protocol for that? Where do children go when they hide? When children typically hide, they go into hidey holes because when you're trying to hide, you're trying to reduce the signature of your body by getting small, getting neat, getting tidy. 
So what are you doing when you're in a ball, in a cabinet, hiding? What you're really doing is setting yourself up for failure. Because an indiscriminate person who is only trying to kill innocent human life doesn't care what situation you're in. It will open the door, it will see you in the fetal, and it will gun you down. So if we're preparing our children to fight back, what tools are we giving them? None, because we just told them to hide. They're not in a posture to fight back. And what are they going to fight back with? The fact that our teachers right now are not armed with firearms bewilders me. If you're a teacher and you're listening to this, I want you to hear me very clearly. If you can carry in your school, because the laws allow it, you need to get a firearm, you need to get trained, and you need to take that job seriously. Because you are the defender and the shield between evil and good, and your children are good. The only thing stopping that evil is you. You could, you could tuck your head between your legs. You could close your ears off to the world and pretend like this doesn't exist. Or you could be best prepared to confront evil. Imagine if those teachers who were in that classroom had a firearm. And they were able to defend their children. They just weren't carrying a firearm, but they were trained in situational awareness. They were trained in technical gunfighting. How would that have changed the course of history in that time? I would have loved to read the story that Uvalde, Texas teacher, draws pistol, shoots active shooter and ends active shooting before it even began. But we're not reading that. That guy got inside that classroom, killed those two teachers really fast. It happened fast, I guarantee it. He shut and locked that door from the inside. And those kids were sitting ducks. Those poor, poor children. The amount of pain and suffering in that room will haunt the, ki the kids who lived through it for the rest of their lives. There's likely to be more casualties because children are fighting for their lives today, right now. We're telling our kids in the acronym to fight. They don't have the ability to fight. In a study done by John Leach, looking at survival catastrophe survivors analyzing the people that lived and the people that died who do you think died the most children they don't have developed prefrontal cortexes experiences rational decision making and so they often make the wrong decision who do they depend on their mothers their fathers they need leadership they need guidance. What do those children have to protect them? Hopes and prayers wouldn't have saved those kids. But an adult with a firearm that was trained would have. The recommendation for the acronym that I'm recommending for you is an acronym called OFF. Observe, fight, and flee, or flee and fight to be used inversely. Observe is the first component to it because you don't want to just send your kids running in a haphazard direction to potentially run into harm's way. You want them cognitive. So when they're thinking through problems, when they rehearse and they train, they're using their heads. They have to make a decision for themselves and their own survival. That decision could mean using a glass breaker or opening the window. Breaking contact off the X where the danger is happening. Removing themselves physically in time and distance with as many obstacles in between them and the danger. 
We need them to understand that they need to take in the information and make a decision based on the information they're receiving. Children, you hear gunshots coming from the right. Where are you going? To the left. How are you going? How are you moving? Which direction are you moving in? Are you going to go out the window or are you going to go out the door? Having the conversation is a start point and creating protocols around those answers is how we get kids to survive. Officers were breaking the glass out of windows to allow the children to escape. Why don't they have the ability to escape? We spend millions and millions of dollars creating fortified prison systems with security and protocols, keeping them in. But we don't have any security protocols keeping bad people out of our schools. The next part of that is flee. I want you to observe, take in the information, analyze the information, and determine a course of action. But the best course of action is to displace yourself physically with time and distance and obstacles in between as rapidly as possible. Because just because you're processing information doesn't mean you can't continue movement. Because movement off the X statistically is the greatest probability of survival. By moving yourself away from that bad circumstance as quickly as possible. Where their shooter is, is where the crisis point is. That's where the disaster is taking place. It was proved in the Virginia Tech shooting when the suspect went door to door, classroom to classroom, and these kids were barricaded in their classrooms with nowhere to go, and he methodically went and broke into each class and shot one student at a time. 90% plus students that were shot and killed were shot in the head because he was shooting them at close uh, proximity. In the book, uh, Amanda Rising writes an unthinkable, a story of one of the young men who were in the classrooms that he entered, where he thought he passed out. He was faking his own death, but he was also in a parasympathetic state. We understand it as a faint, quit, collapse response where opiates are dumped into our system to facilitate the process from life to death as an easier transition to disassociate memories. He played dead. He was bypassed by the shooter. Everybody else in the classroom was shot. The shooter leaves. The shooter comes back to finish off anybody else who is still alive. How are we setting our children up for success? We're not. We're setting them up for failure. How are our children supposed to fight? If they can't fight because they're children, then we need to give them the tools to escape, the the tools to flee, the tools to break contact. One, in the protocol, I recommend, number one, access points at every school. Just like we have at government institutions where you have to go through a process to get into that school, the inconvenience of going through a checkpoint is just the inconvenience you're going to have to deal with. If you do it at TSA, you're going to have to do it at your local school. What are taxpayers' dollars for? Another thing that we need is perimeters on these schools. Our schools should be fenced off like government institutions. If Home Depot is fencing off all of their lumber because they don't want people breaking in and stealing their lumber, then we can have fencing around our schools to protect somebody from wandering into a school and not let it be known. The technology gap integrated will mean less people, more observation on more angles. That duty Uh, On-duty officer, that's the school resource officer, should be armed, should be in a monitoring room where he can monitor cameras, a suspicious activity. He should be able to see every single angle of the school and be notified. I have a, a vivid security system that notifies me via text of any intrusions, any motion sensors and detection. And it was a couple grand. We can't have that at our school at our schools. That's bull crap. 
We could have that at our schools right now. You have a Starlink system hooked up to it, which is satellite internet. You have security systems, uh, CCTV, close uh, circuit uh, security systems in place that could trip sensors, activate a notification, and give us early warning and detection of people who are trying to do our children harm. We need a locked um, school protocol. When school's in session, when we are going into teaching our children inside the building, there is no access to that building unless you have key access. In special operations, I was in a unit that had a badge that allow you to scan and open a door. We should have that for our teachers. Our teachers should be trained in the security protocols of exactly how to operate and what to do, and it should be rehearsed, and it should be practiced often. All of these integration, uh, uh, integrated security procedures are very easy. You're talking about one week per school to get this stood up. Why would we not do this for our children? The next thing I recommend is having uh, a liaison to come in and go over the exact emergency procedures in the event of an active shooter. It should be sim-based, it should be reality-based, and it should happen in real time. Just like when I was a, a student growing up in elementary school and in, in junior high school in Florida, where we would do tornado drills, hurricane drills, we hide underneath our desk, we'd barricade in place, we need to be doing that for our children for active shooter. Not only should our teachers be trained in security uh, procedures, but they should also be trained in first aid. Why would they not be? They're dealing with our children for a third of the day. For 18, uh, 15 years of their life. From preschool to senior high school, we are depending on a public institution to raise our children. Why would we not expect that they would have those security measures in place? The reason flee and fight are used inversely is because our children should always be prepared to fight. But how are they going to know what they're made of? How are they going to understand how to fight if they're not practicing it? If they're not inoculated in the stress? We're not going to take this seriously, guys. What I'm going to do is push litigation forward and try to get everybody in the state on the same sheet of music. I'm going to go out to all these schools. I got notifications from Missouri, San Diego, Sacramento, uh, Texas, all over the United States. And I'm going to introduce these protocols. But you need to, in your own backyard, start right now. It starts with litigation. It starts with emailing and notifying every public official and demand change. Demand change. If you're a member of that school board, you better start bringing it up. If you're on the school board, you better start bringing it up. If you want litigation, you start petitioning it for, right, for it right now. There are several methods and different ways, depending on the state that you live in. But if you start that petition, you start shaking the trees, start making the email, start blasting it out on social, you could make that change effective immediately. These school officials want that job. They want that power. They could have that power as long as they do their job. Those people that are politicians work for you. You don't work for them. They work for you. They are public servants for you, the taxpayer. Hold them accountable. And all of those politicians who are talking about gun control, you need to Vote them out of their positions. Because all we're going to do is create the laws to pander to the politicians that will do nothing for our children. Do you think the gun laws would have changed the outcome of this guy who was a whack job and killing these children? We need to make change. We can make change in our own backyard by starting now. 
Guys, I got a long form episode on mentors for military podcasts, which I'll post up on my social at mike.a.glover. In my story, it'll be up there today for the next 24 hours. That's a long form podcast on everything active shooting. I wanted to get this out into the airwaves to talk about it. If you got comments on the YouTube, leave your comments below. I'm starting litigation right now. I'm starting to contact these schools right now. We need the change. We've been doing it behind closed doors, training in active shooting. I have instructors that work at the sheriff's department in my local town that teach, teach active shooters. The schools need to get involved. The parents need to get more involved. Or we'll just be waiting for the next mass shooting in the next school. That's all I got, guys. Pray for the families and the victims of this shooting. A horrible tragedy, but there's things that we could do right now to make a difference. Not to make it better, because it's not going to get better. But we can make a difference. Later, guys. Later, guys.